Hi, I'm Miranda Wright. This is day five of our 120 day upper room prayer campaign. Today we stoke the fires of urgency for evangelizing and saving the lost by reminding ourselves of the biblical reality of hell and praying for those who are bound for it. The vast majority of Jesus' earthly ministry was focused on warning people of the reality of the final judgment and of hell. And we can't assume to improve on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can only hope to do as good as he did by doing as he did. Jesus talked about hell probably more than any other topic, and yet the church that claims his name seems to talk about it the least. Jesus said that it was a place where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. He said it was a place void of the very presence of God. And we can't even begin to comprehend that because we've never experienced that. Because the Bible says that God is love. He is the Prince of Peace. He is our comforter. He is our blessed hope. We can't even comprehend experiencing a place that is absolutely void of love, of peace, comfort, and of hope. We've experienced a deficit in those areas at moments and times of our life, but we've never experienced being in a place that is totally separated and cut off from the presence of God, a place of eternal judgment where there is no more hope. Jesus said that it was a place of weeping and of gnashing of teeth, a place of eternal torment. The Bible says that for the hope that was set before him, Jesus was able to endure the suffering and the shame of the cross. The reason he endured the suffering that he went through, the shame, the reproach, the torture, was for the hope that we might be saved from this eternal torment. His passion was based in the reality that what he went through was to save us from this destination. He had a revelation of the destination and it gave him a heart for the nations. Many of us have lost our sense of urgency for evangelism because we've lost hold on the reality of hell. And many a lost soul shrug off the need for a savior because they have no idea what they need saving from because nobody loved their soul enough to get a little uncomfortable and tell them that there is an eternal judgment in hell awaiting for all those who will not humble themselves before the mighty hand of God and seek the way of escape, the only way, the truth, the way in the life. You offer them Jesus and the good news of the gospel and they don't realize that they need it because being saved is not good news when you don't know what you need to be saved from. Nearly all of Jesus' parables were based on giving a revelation and a warning that there would be a final judgment, that sinners, the self-willed, and the unbelieving would all be cast into a lake of fire. He talked about the separating of the wheat from the tares and how the wheat would be brought into the master's barn, but the tares, the weeds, would be thrown into the fire. He talked about the separating of the sheep and the goats and how the sheep would be set at his side and they would be brought into the master's house, but the goats would be cast out into eternal fire. He talked about the parable of the ten talons and the unfruitful servants and how they would be cast into outer judgment. He gave the parable of Lazarus who had died and gone to hell and was crying out for God to send someone to warn his family not to end up in this dreadful place. He talked about unfruitful trees and how if you will not bear good fruit, you will be cut down and cast into the fire. He was always warning of the fire. He was warning of hell. Because he loved your soul enough to warn you, even though people hated him for it, even though they jeered him for it, even though he was despised and rejected, beat, torn down, shamed, tortured, and crucified. He was still willing to tell you the truth for the blessed hope that you might believe him and be saved. The gospel of Jesus Christ is clear. There is a hell, and if we don't believe Jesus, it will be our destination. Lord, give us a revelation of the destination that we might be saved, that we might live for eternity and not for today, that we might have an urgency to reach the lost and see them saved. We have to decide whether or not we really believe the word of God because it is the height of insanity to base our lives on a faith that is based on a book that we don't believe. And if you do believe that hell is real, then what are you doing for heaven's sake? Some might say that warning of hell is fear-mongering. 
but it's not fear mongering. It's the truth and only the truth can set you free. Jude chapter one, verse 21 says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference and of others save with fear, pulling them out of the very fire, hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. If you believe the word of God, stop worrying about what people think and start worrying about souls. Aren't we to please men or God? We offer men a parachute and tell them they need it to save their life, but we never tell them that the plane is going to crash and burn, so they reject it. They don't understand the need to be saved. They don't understand the need for a savior if they don't understand the final destruction that awaits if they don't take the way of escape. The Bible tells us that there will be a final day of judgment when all men stand before the throne of God and are judged according to their deeds and their works and the book of life is opened up and read out and all their deeds are read before all men, all the saints and the angels will hear the account of our life and see how it lined up with the word of God. On that day, the secrets of every heart will be revealed and there will be no pleading. But there will be those who have believed the words of Jesus Christ, taken them to heart and lived by them. And though they gave up much in this life, they will have gained much in eternity. Are you prepared for it? Because none of us are promised tomorrow. And if you are prepared, is everyone that you know prepared? Because if not, then you have a job to do. I'm laying the foundation for fervent prayer this morning. Because the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. And we've covered righteousness, but how do you gain fervency? You get fervency when you get a revelation of the urgency. And you get a revelation of urgency when you get a revelation of the destination. Many times when you tell people about God, they'll say things like, If God is so good, then why does he allow evil? When the reality is that he does because if he eradicated evil, he would have to eradicate us. And he loves us, so he is patient and takes us through a process to eradicate the evil in us rather than to eradicate us. God is love. God is mercy. He is not sending us to hell. We are choosing to separate ourselves from him. We are choosing to walk in the error of our own way. We are choosing. The Bible says that whom you serve is your master. If you are a servant of sin, then you make Satan your master. But if you choose to be a servant of righteousness, then you make God your master. He is not sending us anywhere. He is not forcing anything on us. He suffered to give us a way of escape, but we choose our master, choose ye this day whom you will serve. He is long suffering towards us and patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he takes us through a process that will eradicate the evil in us so that he does not have to eradicate us with the evil that we have taken on. But those who refuse to go through the process will eventually face judgment when evil finally is eradicated. Because hell is a quarantine for evil. The Bible talks about separating the wheat from the chaff. We are the wheat. The chaff is the things of this world and the flesh and the lust and the selfishness and the desire. If you want to break it down, all sin is rooted in selfishness and all righteousness is rooted in selflessness. And God is trying to break that selfishness off of us, to break the sin off of us, to break the evil off of us. But if we cling to the chaff, the chaff is like a paper hole that surrounds the wheat. It's like a flesh around it and it's pointless. It's worthless. The wheat cannot be used to be made into bread so that it can be something that is edifying to the body until the chaff is removed. But in the process of removing the chaff, if the wheat clings to the chaff, the wheat gets cast out with the chaff. And this is what happens. God is trying to remove the flesh, remove the chaff, remove the selfishness from us. But if we cling to those things, we will be removed with it. And it's not his desire. The Bible says it is not his will that 
any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He makes a way and he is patient and he is long suffering and he endures. And we continue in this world bringing evil upon ourselves because we will not surrender to the truth and the way and the life that he has provided to get us out of this condition. We have to surrender and let go of selfishness because selfishness is the seed of all evil. We hear a lot that money is the root of all evil. It actually says the love of money, not money itself. The love of money is the root of all evil because the love of money is a manifestation of selfishness. It's how we most clearly express our concern about self. When the Bible says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and to love your neighbor more than yourself, to esteem others better than yourself, to take the low seat, to be humble and allow God to exalt you, but God resists the proud. So surrender and let go of your selfishness now so that he can save you or cling to it and be cast into hell with it. Because this is where God finally eradicates evil. And all those who say that if God is so good, why does he allow evil in the world? When the day finally comes where he finally deals with all the evil in the world, they will be the ones weeping and wailing and crying out because they did not humble to his way of escape, which came to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, give the people a revelation of the destination that they might turn to you and repent. The Bible says... That broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many are they that walk thereon, but narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are they that find it. And when we really grasp hold of the reality of what Jesus is saying there, he's literally telling us that most people are on the path to hell. So what are we doing about it? Because we are only still here in this earth because it is not his will that they should perish but he has given us the commission to go out and to bring the gospel the good news the salvation the way of escape but it's not good news because we're not telling the people what they need to be saved from oh god put that revelation in us and bring back the truth of the gospel that we would not think we could improve on the teachings of Jesus Christ, but that we would believe and trust the purity and the perfection of it to bring the sinner to salvation and give them the full counsel of God's word, not worried what man might think, but worried about the eternal souls of those you have put before us. In the book of Isaiah chapter 5, 14, it says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth wide without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and they that rejoice shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God, that is holy, shall be sanctified in righteousness. The prideful will be humbled. We can choose to humble ourselves before God now and be saved in eternity. Or we can stand in our pride against him and be humbled on the day of judgment. But every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and they will be humbled. You choose to be humbled now or you are forced to be humbled later. When you realize the reality of the love and the mercy of the words that he has said and what he endured to bring them to us. It continues to say, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble. And the flame consumeth the chaff, so their roots shall be rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. It's not enough to believe that he is God. You have to believe what he says as God. To believe that he is God and still not obey his word is the height of rebellion. It would be better to not believe that he was God at all than to believe that he is God and still not take what he says seriously. We have to face facts and stop playing games and start living and ministering like we believe the truth that Jesus gave us and get serious about eternity and saving the lost. 
Jesus said in John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life eternal. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the father said unto me, so I speak. Do you understand the words that Jesus is speaking? He is saying that on the day of judgment, on that final day, when we stand before the throne of God and the word says the book of life is open, the book of life is the very scripture itself, because Jesus said, it's not even me that's going to judge you. It's these words that I have spoken that will be your judge because these words were from God. And I have said only what he told me to say, and the book will be opened and you will stand before it. And the mirror of your life will be played out to see if it aligns with these words because if you believe that I am who I am then you will believe what I say and if you believe what I say then it will be reflected in the actions of your life and if your life and your belief does not line up with the word of God then you are damned because of unbelief because of unbelief the Israelites in the wilderness could not enter into that promise it does not matter if you believe in him. It does not matter that you believe that God is real if you did not believe him. In the book of James, it says, oh, you say that you believe that Jesus is the son of God. Oh, vain man. Even the demons believe and tremble. At least they tremble. That's more than most who claim to believe that do not work out their salvation in fear and trembling. As the word says, he says it takes more than just believing that he is God. You have to believe in the words that he has spoken. Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, that not those who profess him as Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the father in heaven because they have believed the words. In fact, it's the same passage where he talks about the many that are on the broad way to hell and the few that are on the narrow way to heaven. And he says the many that he's talking about that are on the broad way are those who say to me, Lord, Lord. But I will tell them in that day, depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you because you did not do the will of the father. That means that those many on the broad way to hell thought they were going to heaven. They thought they were saved because they professed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they never laid down their sin. They never repented. They never believed the words that he said, walked in them, lived in them, and did the will of the Father which is in heaven. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, but we have to believe what he said also. Because if we believe that he is God, but still choose to reject the words that he said, then we are walking in the height of rebellion. Jesus warned that many profess me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We have to come to terms and help others to see the reality that Jesus is the word made flesh, according to John chapter one. And if we don't believe the entirety of his word, then we don't believe him. And if we don't believe him, then we are already damned, according to that same chapter. It says that Jesus was the light and he came into the darkness and the darkness rejected him and did not receive him. And that in the end, many will be lost because they would not receive the love of the truth. He is the truth, the way and the life. He is the straight and narrow. The words that he said, they will judge us one day. We have to believe them. We have to live by them. We have to preach them. We can't alter them. We can't compromise them. We can't improve on them. We have to share them. He said that if you will go out into all the world and make disciples and preach this gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, not another Jesus, not another gospel, the gospel that Jesus released because every word he spoke was from the father. If we preach that gospel, then we will see souls saved and lives changed and signs and wonders will follow because he said, if you preach this gospel, then I will be with you even until the ends of the world and signs and wonders will follow those that believe, but only those that believe this gospel and preach this gospels and make disciples after this gospel because the miracle worker will only move to validate the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ unto the saving of the lost. 
That means we have to examine our hearts and some belief systems that are contrary to the word of God. Things that we will pray about more specifically in later prayer podcasts. But we have to ask ourselves, where do we stand? Do we stand in alignment with the world that we might be judged by God? Or do we stand in alignment with God even though we will be judged by the world for it? Where do we stand on issues like abortion? Because the word of God says that it is an abomination and that it brings a curse upon a nation that allows it. Where do we stand on issues like homosexuality? Because the Bible says that you cannot be saved and continue in this sin. You can be saved from the sin. Of course, everyone is born into sin. We are, that's why we need a savior. We can be saved from the sin, but we cannot be saved while we remain in the sin. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. Do we believe in biblical creation? Because Jesus himself endorsed it. So we have to examine the things that we've been told and make a choice. What side we're going to be on? Do we believe God or do we believe men? Do we seek to please God or do we seek to please men what do we really believe many of us have created a God in our own mind that we fit into our own worldview that we think is going to be there to receive us into heaven but we are on the broad path with all the others that have lost their way because they're not aligning themselves with the word of God we have got to stop breaking the second commandment of the ten commandments and worshiping a God of our own making and humble ourselves to the God of the word and the word of God the God of Isaac Jacob and Abraham we have to humble ourselves before the God of the Bible before we are humbled by hell Jesus said if we don't believe the words of this book we are already damned and will end up in hell only by believing what he said can we be saved if we believe the words of this book then why are we not more fervent about saving the lost from the hell it warns them about Oh Lord, we need a revelation of the destination. Oh God, put the raw word of truth in the mouths of the preachers again. Lord, that the lost might be saved. Remove the fear of man and bring the fear of the Lord back, God. Remind them that your word says that we each have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And you are a God that is just. You are a God of love. You are a God of mercy that endured all that we might be saved. But your word says that you are both love and severity to those who have been saved, to those who have been plucked from the fire, to those who have humbled themselves to your truth. You are mercy, but to those who reject it, you are severity. You are a God of justice and you will do what you say you do. You will honor your promises for the good and for judgment. God, everything you say you will honor. And we love to cling to that as as an assurance of your great and mighty promises, but it is also an assurance of judgment, God. So help us to get an understanding and a revelation of eternity that we might grab hold on eternal life and live for then and not for now. God, we spend more time, energy, and focus planning for a retirement that's only going to last most of us a few years, probably less than a decade, than we spend on preparing our soul and our families for eternity that is going to be everlasting. God, give us an understanding that it's not about here and now. It's about the then and there. It's not about today. It's about that day, the great day, the final day. It's about when we stand before you and all the secrets of the hearts of men are revealed God give us an urgency in prayer that we might have a fervency in prayer again God that we might cry out for the lost that we might burn with passion that we might go out into the highways and the byways and in the streets and take hold on the souls of those who are heading for hell God get it in our spirit that the gospel of Jesus Christ is perfect but many are not hearing the whole gospel so they don't even know why it's such good news they don't know why they need a savior they don't know what they're being saved from because we're too afraid to speak the truth and be called a fear monger oh god put a 
fear in the heart of your own people that they might do your will and begin to walk in wisdom because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear, it's where wisdom begins because it drives us to obey your wisdom and submit to it. But it's only where it begins. It begins in fear, but it ends in love because once we see what you endured to save us from, then we begin to understand your love for us. And then we can love you because we understand that you truly did first love us. Oh God, shake the church and wake the church, God. They're looking for a new truth to discover when what it really needs is an old truth recovered. Bring back the hellfire and brimstone preachers of old that were more concerned about saving your soul than losing your tithe. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, God, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And more times than not, we're more eager to be kissed by a Judas than for the chastisement of a father that might save us from the consequences of our own rebellion. God, give us a people that are willing to hear the truth, that are willing to stand before you with fear and reverence and to do the work of the gospel that the lost might be saved, to lay down their selfishness and give up their convenience and take a little time out of their schedule that they might lay hold on eternity for themselves and for someone else, that they might spend time in prayer praying for their lost loved ones, that they might go out and talk to somebody on the street or in the store or in the workplace. God, give us a people that are not willing to see their school go to hell, that are not willing to see their co-workers go to hell, that are not willing to see their church members go to hell for the sake of comfort. Oh God, bring us a heart of compassion. Bring back the passion. Bring us understanding of our life everlasting God. God, if you've got to bring it in a vision, if you've got to bring it in a dream, if you've got to cause them to open up the word continually to it, make it real to us, God. Make it real. Because your word is sure, your word is true, and your word will be our judge. And on the day of judgment, we will have no excuse because you laid it before us. Oh God, and here in America, we will face amongst the greatest judgment because we have the greatest access to the truth. Many people are dying, God, for the sake of reading one page of your precious word. But we have access to it freely. We have it in print. We have it in digital. We have it in audio. We have it in every form and fashion. We can access it at any time. It is literally in the palm of our hand. And we do not read it. And we do not believe it. Yet we claim your name and do nothing but bring shame and reproach upon it. Because we are not living the words that you spoke. We are not believing the things that you said. We are not teaching it. Oh God, we cry out for the lost. God, we cry out in desperation that they might be saved. We don't want to see the multitudes cast out. We don't want to see our friends and our family counted among the goats, Lord, on that final day. God, I'd rather stand with you in heaven with five or six that I showed the truth of your word to and they chose to humble themselves and believe it than to stand in hell with a congregation of 10,000 that I lied to and led straight into the pits because I wanted comfort, because I wanted to be accepted, because I wanted the praise of men, because I counted the treasures of this world of more value than the prize of Jesus Christ and eternal life. Oh God, the world tries to tell us that tolerance is love, but if that tolerance is leading them to a place of damnation, then it is not love. It is pure selfishness on our part. It is self-love because the reality is, is that many times we convince ourselves that we don't want to offend someone with the truth when the reality of it is, is that we don't want to get offended if they reject the truth that we offer. It's not about loving them. It's about loving ourselves. It's about selfishness. The selfless love of God will speak the truth even if they persecute you for it because you are determined with a blessed hope. You are driven that one might be saved. 
God, give us the heart of Christ. Give us your love, a true love, an enduring love, an uncommon love that is willing to endure all that we might lead one unto repentance and save their soul from hell. Give us a biblical love, God, a true love, an agape love. Not the Eros love that the world is trying to sell us. Not this selfish, self-centered love that the world is, that the world is trying to pour on us. It is counterfeit. It is the lust of the flesh. It is the pride of life. And it will lead the soul straight to hell. But only the love of the truth will lead us to life everlasting God we love you for you are the truth we love you God for suffering to bring us the truth we love you God enough to speak the truth and we love the souls of men enough to bring them the truth in Jesus mighty name oh God put your word in us like a fire shut up in our bones that we might be as the prophet Jeremiah and stand before men and say you know what you hated me for saying it you reviled me for saying it and I don't even want to say it anymore but I can't not say it because the truth of God burns inside of me like a fire shut up in my bones the spirit of God that holy spirit of fire moves me it drives me it compels me to warn you that you will bust hell wide open if you don't submit yourself to the word and will of God it doesn't matter what you say with your mouth it matters what you believe in your heart and what you do that proves what you believe because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth will speak and the actions of your body will fall in line with it the tree is judged by the fruit and those that do not bear good fruit or cut down and cast into the fire oh God woe unto those that honor you with their lips but their hearts are far from you woe unto those God who claim your name but bring shame by not believing and living your word woe unto those that are gonna have to face the words of this book one day God we cry out for them God we cry out for them Bring a revelation of the destination, Lord. Help them to understand the reality of damnation. For God, that they might understand your great love and mercy and what you have offered. God, that they might take your way and and lay aside their self-will. God, your word says that there are many that make themselves a spot in your feast of charity. They make themselves a blemish upon your church because they are self-willed. They will not submit to the will of the Father. Save this nation, God. Save this people. Save them from the judgment that is to come, God, because they had the truth and rejected it. Because they believed a lie. Because they believed what people told them. Because they believed what they read on the internet. Because they believed what a preacher said from a pulpit, but they didn't open your word and believe what you said. God, save this people. Give them a hunger for the truth. God, we pray for a wave of truth, for a revelation of the truth of your word, for the full gospel, the true gospel, the entirety of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for conviction upon the souls and the hearts of men that they would, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, open up the Bible and start in the Gospels and read your teaching, read your preaching, and live accordingly, regardless of what anybody says, any preacher, teacher, prophet, or denomination, Lord. If it doesn't agree with you, we don't agree with it. We stand in unity with the Spirit under the mighty hand of God, in agreement with the Word of God, submitted to it, God, doing all that we can to live by it because we know that if we do all that we can then you'll take care of the rest God because there's much we cannot do but if we aim for the mark of the high calling then you'll carry us through God we lay it at your feet and we surrender it all we are willing to give up everything in this life that we might gain everything in the life to come because you said anyone who wasn't willing to give up 
everything was not worthy to be your disciple, your follower, to call themselves by your name. Oh God, many are calling themselves by your name, but you never called them by your name. Many will stand before you on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, and you will say, you say you know me, but I don't know you because you're still working iniquity and you never did the will of my father. You say you believe in me, but you did not believe me. You did not take the words of my book and now this book will judge you. These words will judge you. I will not judge you. The word was laid before you and you did not believe it. Oh God, I believe it. Let each person individually today lay their heart down and say, God, I believe it. I choose to believe it. I choose to believe it. I'm going to open it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to let it stoke the fires of fervency in me in prayer and in warfare and in evangelism and in witnessing. I'm going to go out by the power of the Holy Ghost and be a witness and make disciples of all men. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and you will be with me even unto the ends of the earth. And signs and wonders will follow because I have believed. Oh God, I'm so tired of seeing people following after signs and wonders when signs and wonders were meant to follow after us if you're following after signs and wonders then it's the sign that you don't believe because if you really believed signs and wonders would be following after you the signs and the wonders are for the lost the word is for the found he is the word we receive the word we believe the word and we will live according to it and we will pray fervently and we will go out and we will reach the loss like there's no tomorrow because we're not guaranteed tomorrow but we are all guaranteed that final day where we stand before the mighty throne of God and give an account for our life and how it proved what we really believed and he will say on that fateful day, one of two things. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Or depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Into everlasting punishment and damnation. And on that day, the word says, there will be wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a fearful day. What a glorious day. What that day is for you depends on what you do right now.